Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ursula. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, and, and grateful for your, for your warm introduction. Uh, and I'm also so happy and grateful for being invited to give, uh, give this le lecture. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this series of talks on a topic um, that actually goes to the heart of my research, as I think you mentioned, how we in the humanities and as part of broader interdisciplinary endeavors can relate to, work with, research and reach out to that which is beyond the human. What are our tools, capacities and competences? What is at work in the Anthropocene? And what do we as collectives and collectively, whoever this collective might be, what do we uh, work with? Um, so um, I have invited you into this lecture by a title that points to the role of paper, of text and documents in and for the Anthropocene. And I'm really happy that you are still with me with such a boring and dry title and even a boring and dry uh, topic uh, for a talk on the lively Anthropocene. So I really hope that I will be able to have you joining me uh, on a tour in and with documents and, and how that matters to the Anthropocene. So it's okay, can I test with you, Ursula? Is it okay? Can you follow me? Is it my, my voice is okay with you? It's perfect. Christine. It's perfect, thank yeah, you so much. Yes, yes, thanks. <laughs> so um, uh, let me start somewhere else rather than, than with the documents just right away. Uh, let's start here with a welcome to the Anthropocene. This photo may indeed stand as a symbol of it, the whole epoch of the Anthropocene, so to speak, in a glimpse. The Anthropocene as the age of humans, humans who literally, as you can see, make their mark on their age and the planet, setting their footprint on it. And by doing that, turning themselves into its masters, standing on top of it by conquering and combating it. But not only, I would argue, is this photo a symbol, also far more concretely, does it serve as an entry point to the Anthropocene in a double sense, I would argue, it can speak to the ongoing issue with regard to when was the Anthropocene, its very beginning, and related to that, what kind of events are apt to characterize the Anthropocene as an epoch. It is sometimes suggested that it is the invention of the steam engine that ought to mark the beginning of the Anthropocene. In that case, modern whaling, as you can see here, um, is a case in point. It was precisely the steam engine in combination with the grenade harpoon mounted on the ship that enabled whalers to hunt these large animals down, bring them to shore and initiate the oil age that preceded ours. Because it was uh, the, the whale gained its commercial worth first and foremost from the oil that could be extracted and manufactured from the blubber under their skin. Hence, the very event of modern whaling can be related quite directly to the coming on of the Anthropocene. Also in another way is this so. The hunting down of the large whales is inextricably linked to the Anthropocene in the meaning of the human capacity to have other species go extinct. As it was put before Parliament, the Norwegian Storting in 1879, and I quote, it is commonly known that in later years, a war of extinction has begun against the species of whales present in the Varangefjord in the east of Finnmark. Confronted with this unsettling issue, these once so lively and massively present huge creatures, possibly the largest animals ever living on earth, the extinction issue, the weapon with which these animals were caught, the flesh of nature, its very material, its sounds and smell. What on earth could be the interest and relevance of those entities that are in the title of my talk? Documents, words, paperwork. And true enough, documents do come with a somewhat bad reputation, not the least if what we are interested in are real stuff, real problems, real and li lively nature. 
For instance, the material turn in cultural studies broadly conceived is sometimes established precisely in opposition to discourse and to words, thus words in opposition to words. The distance between the lively world out there and the supposedly dull and only bleak copy of words and papers becomes particularly acute, it seems, when it comes to the species with which I have introduced this lecture, namely the great whales. It speaks perhaps to the fascination with them, as well as the admiration of them, that when writing about them, when trying to describe them and capture them in words, imprint them in documents, their authors become acutely aware of the impossibility of the task of catching them in precisely this way, in words. In the introduction to Herman Melville's, Melville's Moby Dick, Tanner elaborates on precisely this issue. What does it mean that both man writes and fishes? What, if any, is the connection between what we haul up in words and haul up in nets? What, in short, is the relation between text and world? And the introduction moves on to address how precisely this is a key topic of the book as such. Ishmael, the whaler writer, knows that the great sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. He is an unwritten life. Of course, Tanner reminds us, Ishmael Melville's is a written book. And Tanner adds, we must not expect to find Moby Dick in Moby Dick. And likewise, in another giant whale book by Burnett, here in his The Sounding of the Whale, Burnett alerts us to the same great divide, so to speak, between the whale in its flesh and the books into which it is written. And I quote, this is a book about whales, but there are relatively few whales in it. And Burnett is very well aware, though, that his reader knows this already. And I quote, since even the smallest dolphin needs much more room than the largest stream size of the most voluminous scholarly tome. And if we move to Parliament, things do not get much better. At least not if we lend our ear to the Member of Parliament, Søren Jobek, infamous for his efforts to hinder the use of public money in the late 19th century, here in 1888. And I quote, the expenses of the Storting increased tremendously by many and long debates. The Storting's procedures become a boring book, just as much as the machinery involved in quick writing, hurtiskriving or stenography, that means. In order to catch every word in the negotiation is a costly vast machinery, disregarding if the words, words are wise or tiresome, the quick writer runs around the thing in between all seats in order to catch every word on paper, so that also the provinces who cannot hear them still may catch them. Despite job boredom with words and the troubles that was detected above with regard to finding space for a whole whale, even in a large book, in a very large book, what if we bracket it, put on pause this divide between a lively world out there and the limited space for this liveliness in here, on paper, as our problem. What if we rather started from a whole different angle? That we started instead to address what capacities documents have and what documents do, what little documents tools do for large creatures like the whale and for large machineries like governments and assemblies, for politics of nature, yes, for the Anthropocene even. In fact, if we return to Jobeck's bite, even here lies the invitation to another reading. And I repeat, and you can see it here on the screen, the speedwriter or the stenographer runs around the thing, storting, that is, in between all seats in order to catch every word on paper, so that also the provinces who cannot hear them still may catch them. National assemblies can be more or less inviting, depending in part on their architecture, 
the Norwegian Assembly Building inaugurated in 1866 after a lengthy and tense debate is said to be welcoming the nation as a whole by the open arms on each side of the rotunda. And you can see that on the photo. But political assemblies assemble in other ways too. The parliamentary proceedings as the member of parliament Jorbeck catches quite nicely is precisely a, a way of inviting its outsiders at long distance from the very assembly building into the assembly. In other ways, they become, we become virtual witnesses in parallel ways as that which others have shown with regard to experimental science. Following on from this, the parliamentary proceedings cannot simply be addressed as an archive in the sense of a stable site in which the events of the storting are stored for only later to be retrieved. There is more at stake to this. As the French author Gardet has already noted for the French case, that is, and I quote, the stenographers who organized themselves so precisely and so visibly were doing something more than taking notes and writing. They were helping make the parliament the core of French political life." End of quote. Yes, what was going on, she argues, was even more. By this procedure, she argues, public discourse was turned into an authentic artifact, a thing. So let us try developing this a little further. This document work, and we are still talking about the notes, is about more than simply documenting. First, the parliamentary proceedings act as an assembling procedure, assembling the people of a nation constituted as the will of the people and the true public opinion within the assembly. Yet simultaneously, there is a public at a distance but a public which not necessarily are willing to act simply as modest witnesses to what is going on at this insight. And I will return to this as this goes to the core and it's, which is really the topic of my, of my talk. Assemblies are not closed spaces. So what is then the relation between the public out there express, expressing their opinion and the public already residing within the assembly? And how do issues and entities enter and come to matter in and for an assembly? The question that Gardet does not pursue are how document practices and assembling procedures not only assembles, but works upon, challenges and seeks to transform sites such as parliament and issues like the whaling issue. First, a detour. A lot has already been argued with regard to inscription devices and their ability to secure control and discipline over long distances, to render nature, humans as well as non-humans, governable. How inscription devices enable long distance control over people as well as territories, and how they act and make up offices and institutions. Think only of the map and the spreadsheet in Bruno Latour and John Law's accounts and more generally, the governmental technologies of Michel Foucault. Yet, inscriptions devices do not simply control and discipline from a center upon distant places. Inscription devices are simply not only in the hands of centers. Distant places may act back. Moreover, documents may arise and be set on the move to act upon centers from distant places the periphery, so-called. Thus, they may move government, modify how the collective, the public, and its opinions are composed, and enable issues to enter and matter at new places. The whaling issue, I argue, is a case in point. Long distance, they definitely were. The documents on the move, telegrams from communities in Finnmark, such as Hammerfest and Varde, arriving at the heart of government, the Ministry of the, Inf of the Interior from 1873 and onwards. The timing of it was no accident, as the first telegraph line had been installed in Valde only a few years before, in 1870, and the Storting had got established its own telegraph office shortly after, in 1874. So this was indeed an assembling procedure within the heart of the Storting and the Ministry. 
Returning to the inscription devices that John, John Law has analyzed, these document devices, the telegram, work differently than what Law has described. The spreadsheet that Law has been describing is a device, device for centering, as well as strictly restricting what kind of information there is room for and in what form. The telegrams, despite its limitations when it comes to the number of words, you can see here on the telegrams that there are uh, 70 words in it. It rather breaks an issue open, brings in a whole new series of actors and entities whose relations are not predefined or known. An assembling procedure that assembles and opens rather than disciplines and control. Referring back to a series of public meetings, the concern with regard to the ongoing whaling up north and its supposedly de detrimental effects on the fisheries, the so-called Kaplan fisheries are raised in the telegram and investigations and legislations are being asked for. Quite concretely then, the high north is making itself present in the capital of the country in a radically different way than only decades before at the time when another document, the Constitution, was signed at Eidsvoll in 1814, representatives from this uppermost northern country was not even present, thus not represented as the traveling distance was too long. But also in other more conventional material and literary ways did emerging publics from up north present itself to the center. Documents in the form of letters of complaints were passed on to the Ministry of the Interior alongside with the telegrams of which, of which I just spoke. And you can see an example of one of these complaints here. And it is written Klage uh, on the very top uh, of it, if you can see. Documents complained from 1873. And then comes elected members of parliament as well the Member of Parliament, Andreasen, from the County of Finnmark, who, in line with parliamentary procedure, made submit another document, a so-called private bill for a new law to prohibit whaling. Yes, and just let me just close uh, quote so that you see from, from this early telegram. A meeting was, was held yesterday by several hundred fishermen in the profound conviction that the whaling is detrimental to the fisheries along the whole coast of Finnmark. And so what they do is that they ask for a whale conservation law to be put, for, put forward. And this was a telegram from Varda uh, in the spring of 1888 to the Ministry of the, of the Interior. But so also where, where there were moves inside um, parliament too. And as I said, the member of parliament, Andreasen, from the county of Finnmark, who in line with parliamentary procedure made submit another document, as I said, a so-called private bill for a new law to prohibit whaling. Also in this way, parliament was a relatively open space, allowing proposition for bills to come from the outside and in. Wrapped in this infrastructure of parliamentary procedure, you can see the numbered document. The proposed bill is set on the move at the inside of the assembly. However, for only very soon after to be rejected on the grounds of not being sufficiently grounded. Our word is our bond, is the title of Marianne Constable's book on how legal speech acts. But preceding the legal act comes demands to justify. In what ways could possibly that of prohibiting whales, prohibiting whaling, I mean, be grounded? The statements from the publics that were gathering up north, no landing in parliament, comprised a complex situation of a fjord polluted by grease and blood accompanying the slaughtering of whales of noise from the whaling vessels scaring the fishes away, of the disappearing of whales that would normally accompany the fish to the shore, thus enabling these to come close enough so that the fishers in their small open boats could catch them. In this latter sense, the whale was drawn in as a companion species, an assistant and helper to the fisheries. And so, if the whale disappeared, so would the coupling, thus the livelihood of the fishers. Yet, 
What was the bond between Wales and Kaplin? Only hold up in words, empty them as words were deemed to be? Science was called for in order to substantiate the claims and to justify, ground the issue in the belly of the whale itself, because this was precisely the procedures to be followed. A traveling emissary, a zoologist sent off from the capital, entering the whaling scene up north where the bellies of the blue whale could be emptied, thanks to the nice ex exemplars provided by the whalers, the zoologist noted, emptied not only of its fetuses, as you can see here, so that it could be carefully delineated and described. The zoologist was a whale hunter himself of some sort, but emptied also of its diet to be traced within the inside of the whale. You might remember Simon Schaffer and Stephen Shapin's Leviathan and the air pump and their ways of portraying how science came to be marked off from the free play of politics and war. How this happened by a set of material and literary technologies, such as what I describe and with Donna Haraway as modest witnessing and naked writing, a style of no style that would secure direct transparent access to the production of facts and to trust in their very making. In the trial of a whaling, however, as with regards to the fishery issues more generally, science with its inscription procedures and document practices not only went, but even emerged at the heart of the political machinery. Thus, not only did the assembling procedures of the political machinery send science on the move up north, the assembling procedures, the scientist work was being paid for by the state also secured its return. This happened in scientific writing as well as in drawing, dressed in the genre of a traveling report, in itself an interesting form of expert witnessing and a demonstration of the power of document writing that worked across the political assembly, the Royal Academy and the media, all places to where the reports were made to appear and circulate. The blue whale, which in fact got its name here in these parliamentary proceedings in the form of reports from the zoologist, did not take any interest in capelin, as its diet was observed not to be capelin or fish at all, only the little shrimp called krill. Moreover, these species moved, it was noted, by their own instinct. Hence, the imbroglio and entanglements of species the possibly bonding between them were cut off. And so here we can see the zoologist SARS in, a, in a, its way of reporting back to the Ministry of, of the Interior. Science law and the lab, as you can see here from this photo, acted very much as context for, an, for one another in the 19th century. Thus, their literary technologies, style of writing and documenting were moving back and forth in between them, borrowing from one another, experimenting, we could say, with ways of doing the power of document writing. A trial of whether the whale was a fish or a mammal had played out in court in New York only a few decades before. And only in 1758 had the naturalist Linnea withdrawn the whale from the category of fishes and placed it where it still stands and the mammals. The whale was not a fish as here, but a giant animal. The trial that went on in parliament as well as in government was a different one, namely how the whale and with it the whaling was possibly linked to other species including the Kaplan fisheries. However, this was not only a nature issue, a question of taking nature into account and in a correct manner. Whereas the New York trial, as narrated in this book, Trying Leviathan, had put the order of nature at stake. What was at stake here in our case, the Norwegian case, was the political order as well. And it is to that and its implications for our politics of nature, I will now in the last part of my talk turn. 
Interestingly, the issue became, so to speak, the whale itself, and then also a particular version of it, named as the blue whale, not only its diet, but also its slow times of reproduction, and whether the whales could or even already was about to go extinct. And how the business of whaling could perhaps be sustained by conserving the species, a position opposed in a series of addresses to government and the assembly by the whalers. But in fact, already in 1880, did the assembly vote in favor of an experimental non-permanent law prohibiting whaling in parts of the year for it not to intrude with the Kaplan fisheries. Yet the hunting for whales and the whale stations at shore continued to grow, only to be countered by statements on the move from one public meeting to another around the coast. The number of people assembled were meticulously counted, signatures collected, the sites of the meetings named, building a secretary of not only publics, but a public opinion, pressing itself upon the assembly and demanding a permanent conservation law and to have it applied throughout the year. But what is a statement and a signature worth? What count as a legitimate public opinion? Documents in the format of statements were on the move around the Arctic coast, demanding a law that would prohib prohibit whaling. But how to relate to such movement? If result of agitation, as was the allegation, how could they even be taken into account, be taken seriously as something to move on? If the stenographers in Gardet's account above, by diligently recording every word, were securing the authenticity of the public inside the assembly, what about the public being recorded at its outside? Follow me around to yet another turn in this controversy over whaling, into yet another document established by government and sanctioned by the assembly to resolve the situation, into a commission a precursor to what we today would have called a Norwegian um, public report, an expert advisory device in document form, the Whale Commission, as it was to be called. In short, and I need to keep this short, even if it's tempting not to, rather than pursuing these ongoing move, moves of assembling the public opinion, the, com the commission instead put the very public opinion on trial. Representatives of the fishermen were indeed assembled within the commission report, but only to be put on trial as part of a cross-examination in the genre of a, court, of a court case with the head of the commission acting as the judge as well as the prosecutor. In the series of pro problems that were detected, and there were indeed many, the very character of the fishermen was a problem, and I quote, among the, fish, the crowd of the fishermen, there are so many parrots, et de plapreda in Norwegian, who want to show off their experience, but for whom independent thinking is a subordinate concern." End of quote. Hence, the public opinion was not grounded in individuals with the capacity to have an opinion in the first place, nor could their signatures assembled be taken to represent the many and the signatures in themselves not deemed authentic artifacts, if we borrow the words of Gardet, and thus could not count for anything in the assembly. The fishermen were not trustworthy witnesses in the first place, and I quote, the fishermen of Finnmark put more trust in the whale than in their own initiative, end of quote. The problem was rather how this large group of sign signature had come about, in the first place, and I quote again, when being aware of the ease by which such signatures can be attained, the support to such a general outcry and petition without a defined program cannot be given weight. And so along such lines did the commission continue. And it concluded with what had been, it was stated, its objective to substantiate, namely that, and I quote again, the public opinion had not yet passed the test as a scientific argument. In other words, the case was closed as no proofs were established. 
So is what we can see here then simply that the genre of the court, that of presenting proofs before a judge is transferred to the political arena. Let me argue a little bit differently because the situation is different, I think. What was put on trial was the issue of politics, including and most notably a politics of nature. Was politics solely a matter of proofs of authenticity and the already equipped those with the right competence and character to act and to speak. And the question was inextricably linked to the issue of who can speak for his or her own signature and bear witness on human nature entanglements, ways of living. It is now coincidence that the trial played out just here at this time. The, Le the Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes was gone. But how the collective was to be composed in the replacement of the sovereign, who, for instance, that were to have the right to vote, was part of the struggle. In the shadow of the king, to cite Philip Mano, who was to replace him and with which means? The genre of acting upon government was changing accordingly, from the genre of petitions plea, pleading the king or the government to assist, to be benevolent and helping, nicely described in Martin Hummerstadt's book political peasants to demands for self-rule and to act in one's own voice. The documents I have been tracing are all involved in such struggles. So what about the whale? When speaking about the whale issue, I have sometimes started with this question. How is it that the whale, this largest animal that have ever probably lived on the planet, how is it that this leviathan of the ocean can move and land, become present in the assembly, a parliament like the Norwegian Storting, literally translated the large thing, the Storting? The answer I have already given. It comes in the form of document things. And by these little things that are simultaneously tools, large creatures may have a lot of bearing. My aim has been to address how documents are on the move, but also how documents may move others and move things with them. In addressing this, the objective has also been to show that documents are more than discourse. Documents are worldly things integral to our struggles, including our struggles over and in the Anthropocene. Indeed, documents are key sites of struggle, sites where issues become contested, modified, and sometimes transformed. In short, documents, including, including writing them, as that which we struggle, as that with which we struggle. Yet, what that of picturing the large whale on the move to the storting, as I did, does not capture, what, what this does not capture is that the whale, just like other creatures, very seldom enters alone, not even or in its document form. And this is part of the struggle I have intended to show. How that we are dealing with is just as much imbroglios, perplexing situations of things, human non human entanglements, and the procedures by which we strive to work upon them and take these into account in just and justifi justifiable ways. Assemblies like the Norwegian Storting are not, despite the picture, only parliaments of men. In fact, at the time of the whale struggle, when Andreasen, the representative of Finnmark, presented his proposition for a new bill to prohibit whaling, only 8%, less than 8% of the population were qualified to vote. They were perhaps exaggerating, overdoing it a little bit the cartoons that depicted the first socialist entering parliament from the high north, riding on the back of a whale. It is nevertheless a matter of fact that the matter of concern, the concern for the whale, the capacity and, and the concern for the capelin and the codfish came to expand 
to remake, rebuild parliament and open up for an extended version of the demos, the public inside it. But let, let us not become too celebrating. It was the Norwegian Storting that had granted, equipped the industrial whaler Sven Foyn with the authentic document he needed to make his fortune on whaling in the first place. A 10 year patent on his technology package, the grenade harpoon mounted on his steamship. And while the assembly was assembling over and over again, year and year after year, around the whale issue, the blue whale was threatened with extinction. Even a stable archive, a room for it, a room for, of its own, so to speak, a real building from where, from where its remnants could be stored in full size in a museum of whales were never realized, despite the plans and the drawings that were made to plan them. So did also I, in this lecture, exaggerate, overdo it, when I have stressed what documents can do. Take the form of document sites, act as tools, move and be movable, produce our issues, care for our things and capture them and act as our bond. Document work can fail. And my story has also been about failure. Collective efforts of writing may go wrong. But if we constantly fail in our document work, abandon documents and leave documents dead and alone, then we will also let go of the huge collective writing task there is in reworking upon, intervening in and transforming how we do the Anthropocene and the human epoch. So I'll stop there and I will just thank Bård Hubeck with whom I am trying to write a whole book with a whale in it. And Hilde Reinersen with whom I'm working on documents on another book on practice oriented document analysis to extend and orient our methods towards documents and what these can do. And I think I just stop there. Thank you. <laughs>